Welcome to the Widowed Mom Podcast, episode 186, Widows Unfiltered, an interview with Annette Warmoth. Welcome to the Widowed Mom Podcast, the only podcast that offers a proven process to help you work through your grief, to grow, evolve, and create a future you can truly look forward to. Here's your host, Master Certified Life Coach, Grief Expert, Widow, and Mom, Krista St. Germain. Hey there, welcome to another episode of the podcast. I want to introduce you to another widow today. Her name is Annette, and I know many of you are going to relate to her story. I'll let her tell it, of course, but I don't know why I didn't have her on the podcast sooner. Honestly, she graduated from the program quite a while ago. But actually, in a way, I'm kind of glad that I didn't have her on the podcast immediately after she completed the program because she's had a lot of life happen to her since then. And I'm going to let her tell you about that. But one of my goals for Mom Goes On Participants is that by the time you're done, I really want you to not just have solved the problems that you came in with, right? If you come in feeling sad and overwhelmed and lonely or angry, it's not that we just want to address what's bothering you now. I want you to be ready, empowered, equipped. I want you to understand how your mind works. I want you to understand how to navigate difficult emotions because life will still keep happening after six months together, right? And that story is proof of that, that things keep happening, challenging things keep happening. And they're so much easier when you have the right tools. So I'm going to let Annette tell you that story. We'll jump in. Before we do, though, I want to remind you, tomorrow is our private training. It is by application only. It is something that's available to you, or I highly recommend it for you, if you really resonate with the idea of being stuck in a grief plateau. If you are past those early acute grief days, you're back to functioning You are not in bed all day crying. If you wanted to go back to work, you could, right? You are not in the barely surviving stage of grief. You are also not loving your life. This new private training is for you if you are kind of stuck in that surviving place where you are getting by. It's not terrible. It's not unbearable. It's just not enjoyable. You aren't loving your life again. And it's really difficult to imagine how that might happen. But you are functioning in the world, right? And other people are telling you that you're strong and that you're doing great. You just don't feel great. So if you resonate with that, I want to invite you to apply for the free private training. It's called How Widowed Moms Can Truly Love Life Again Without Forcing Gratitude, Thinking Positively, or Reading More Grief Books. I know you. I know you have probably tried those things, maybe not all, but at least some, and they haven't gotten you where you wanted to go. And that's because they just don't work. You do not need to read any more grief books. You do not need to think positively and please do not force gratitude. We're going to talk about what you actually do need to do to love life again. But again, it's by application only. The reason for that is because once it's over, I will be inviting those of you who are interested to join Mom Goes On, and I will be giving all the details of how that works. So if you are not ready for the type of coaching that we offer, I don't want to invite you in, right? And that's not because I don't love you. It's because I want to set you up for success. And early acute grief is not the time for the coaching that we offer inside of my Mom Goes On program. So go to coachingwithkrista.com forward slash love life coaching with Krista.com forward slash love life. And you will get all of the details about the private training and you will complete the application. Assuming that your application is accepted, we will send you everything you need. And again, that private training is tomorrow, December 20th. All right, let's get into my interview with Annette. Enjoy. All right. Welcome Annette. I'm excited to have you on the podcast. We were talking just a little bit before we started, and I don't know why it didn't occur to me until a couple of weeks ago, because I've known you for so long, and you participated in Mom Goes On a couple of years ago, and yet I've never had you on the podcast. So I'm glad that we're finally making this happen. So welcome to the podcast. 
Thank you. Yeah, I am glad to have Annette you. Warmoth, and I did. I took the class about almost two years ago. Yeah, yeah. Let's. I would love it if you just kind of started by telling people just a little bit about who you are, where you live, you know, your person, Ken. Yeah. Well, I live in Puyallup, Washington, and last night we just happened to get about four inches of snow. So, oh my goodness, exciting! Yeah, I met Ken online through an app that I didn't want to be on. My friends put me on there. Okay. I got through a previous marriage that was very, very difficult, so yes. they. They said, no, you're not stopping here. Mm -hmm. Anyway, met Ken. Good friends. Good friends. We got married. Wonderful, wonderful relationship. Oh, my gosh. Amazing man. And just very active, very outgoing. He was a whitewater rafter. Just we were always on the go. And after about 10 years, I noticed him kind of slowing down. But he was getting to retirement age. And I thought, well, maybe he's just tired, you know? Yeah. And it kind of progressed. And then we started going to doctors and trying to find out, you know, what's going on, what really was going on. Mm -hmm. And he had a thyroid problem. So they fixed that. And then we went on and different things just kept happening. We would travel and be in Hawaii and we'd end up in the hospital with a blood clot. Mm -hmm. It was a surface blood clot, but still. So then they just kind of kept progressing. And we were in Italy and he had bad headaches. And we ended up in the ER in Venice, which... That is an interesting story all by itself because you're walking oh. <laughs> in Venice. Anyway, came home. They got his blood pressure down, came home, and the doctor just put him on blood pressure medicine rather than checking to see maybe what caused the headaches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And two years later, he started having terrible headaches again. So we went in, and that's when they did the MRI and found a brain tumor the size of an orange. And so that was a blow. But when we got the call from the neurologist, they said, this is a non-cancerous tumor. It does not invade the brain. It's just pushing your brain. Okay. So they're very easy to get out. No worries. We're going to take this out. You'll be back to where you were at in no time. So we, I was actually very optimistic that we had finally found mm -hmm. what was causing his, all of his problems. He was sleeping a lot by this time. Mm -hmm. So we were very excited that we'd finally got an answer to what was going on. So we went in for surgery a week later. The surgery lasted longer than they thought. His tumor was much harder than the normal melanangioma tumor. Okay. They were able to get it out. The next day, it was amazing. He did not sleep at all. He was vibrant. He was talking. He was excited to go home. I felt like I had my old Ken back mm -hmm. and they said, well, we want you to get up and walk before you go home because you, we know you have stairs at home. And mm -hmm. so he got up to go walking and I was actually packing things up mm -hmm. and I heard this code blue, I believe mm -hmm. it was. And I looked out and I thought, no, not Ken, you know, nothing, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, and be. all of a sudden these EMTs and everybody's racing down the hall. So then I thought, oh, no, 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 no. So I went racing down the hall also just not too far from our room and around a corner and he had collapsed and he was on the ground and they were getting him up onto a gurney and they couldn't get a heart rate, couldn't get a pulse, couldn't get anything. Mm -hmm. And they tried for 40 minutes and I finally had to walk up and say enough and the doctor said, we have the medicine to fix. It was a pulmonary embolism. Okay. And that was the second one he'd actually had in his life. And it, he said, we have the medicine to fix the pulmonary embolism, but if we give it to him, then he bleeds out in the brain. Yeah. No. So I said, there's not an option. Yeah. So anyway, so then I said goodbye to my husband and mm -hmm. that yeah. was the end of my life. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Very, very challenging. And so that was November of 2019? That was November of 2019. Okay. Yes. And at that point, how many kids did we you have had, between the two of you? We had six kids between us, all married mm -hmm. and 15 grandkids. 15 grandkids. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so then what, what was it like for you, you know, in those like early grief days? It was the worst thing I had ever gone through. 
I had never known a relationship like this. And so when Ken was gone, it was, what am I going to do now? Oh my Mm -hmm. gosh. I didn't even know how to go on. Mm -hmm. And I would get up and I have horses. So I would get up and go feed my horses and come home and basically sit on my couch. Mm. And I did that for day in and day out for months. Mm -hmm. I couldn't Mm -hmm. even fathom what would be next. Mm -hmm. So um, we kind of got into COVID. And yes. And then we got Mm -hmm. into COVID two months after he died. What three months after he died, there were shut down. Yeah. So I happened to have a friend call me. I was seven months in. And I distinctly remember that morning sitting on the couch thinking, how can I wish myself to die? With them. But not kill yes. myself. Literally, I wanted to just exit this life. Mm-hmm. And I just I think a lot have- of widows relate to that, where you don't yeah. actually want to do it. You don't actually have suicidal ideation, no. but you wouldn't be sad if a bus came and, and <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I I happened to get a phone call that morning for from a friend to go walking. And I thought, okay, which I don't know what made me go walking that morning. Mm -hmm. I did. I went walking. And as we're walking, she's like, oh my gosh, you need to listen to this podcast. She said, it's a woman who's a widow and she's gone through what you're going through. And she is a coach and she helps you. And I'd never heard of coaching. I'd never heard of podcasts. I thought, okay. And I was just desperate enough that day to come home. And I probably listened to eight or nine or more of your podcasts in one day. And then I called you the next day. But the important thing was, was your first podcast. And I could relate so much to what- well, like the very first one you started at podcast number one, game number on number one. And that was okay. my, that grabbed me immediately because oh, so you had been married 15 years Hugo was an amazing man. You, it was a sudden death. It just so many similarities. And had I not, because I had gone to a therapist Mm -hmm. before that time Mm -hmm. and I didn't feel like he could relate to me. He didn't Mm -hmm. have death like I had had death Mm -hmm. and I didn't feel like I was getting what I needed at that time. But when I heard your podcast, it was like, holy cow. Yeah. I need uh, for some reason person. I kind of thought you came to me through Jody Moore. Am I misremembering that? It may have been my friend who was listening to Jody Moore. Oh, okay. Because she listens to her a lot. Got it. Okay. So it Jody Jody's that. a coach friend of mine, and I've yes. been on her podcast, and she specifically coaches mm-hmm. women with LDS values. Yes. Is kind of her thing. And yes. yeah, I had I had been on her podcast pretty recently, uh, right around that time. So I wonder yes. if your friend. Yes, it there was right there. away because she yeah. I just heard that podcast like the day before Mm -hmm. and she listened to Jody Moore all the time. And I, I now listen to Jody Moore, but I didn't listen to, I didn't listen to podcasts. Didn't even know. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. I'm so glad your friend. I'm so, you know what? I'm really glad. Here's the thing. People ask me all the time. Why do you go on podcasts that aren't grief related? This is why. Yeah. Because everybody knows somebody who, who is in our position. They, they, (laughs) or when they do, they're really interested in helping them. And so I love that your friend was. Your friend was so willing to help you. Yeah. Well, I I believe in inspiration and divine. And I believe that was divine intervention Mm -hmm. that she happened to tell me that day. On the day that I was probably the very bottom of the Mm. hole I had gotten myself into. Yeah. And that was just amazing. It was absolutely amazing. So I called you either that day or the next day Mm -hmm. for an interview. Yeah. My notes say it was July 29th when it was the started, first day that we talked. So we, you, we probably got you in the August group. I think I, I was, I was in the yeah. August group. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Amazing. What was it like to go into the group and how did it compare to what you imagined? The first thing that was so interesting with me, with the group is that you could relate so well to all of us. Mm-hmm. And I found that amazing because I hadn't found that before that someone who could really relate to pretty close to what I was going through. Mm -hmm. And that is, I think, vital to people then thinking, okay, I'm going to listen to her because Mm -hmm. she really has a great idea and knowledge of what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And it's one thing. Where- it's one thing. I always feel kind of bad sometimes for people who are trying to help in grief and all they have is grief theory, yes. because if you don't have the felt experience, the actual having lived it in some form, it really is so much harder to help people. I think. I absolutely agree with that. There's just some experiences. It's like childbirth. You can't mm-hmm. tell somebody what childbirth is like. <laughs> you have to experience that. Yes. yes. And it's the same with death. You can love someone and try to support them, but you can really help them when you've mm-hmm. been in that situation. Yeah. Yeah. So being around somebody who got it, what was it like to be part of a group of women who- I thought the group was really, amazing. I yeah. learned so much from other women who would be on there and sharing their story and Mm -hmm. sharing what they were struggling with. And it was like, oh yeah. And then they would Mm -hmm. say something that I didn't realize I was struggling with. Mm -hmm. They would say, bring it up in one of our coaching classes or sessions. And it was like, oh my gosh, yes, Yes. I do that exact thing. Yes. Very helpful. Very, very helpful. Yes. I love that too. I think it's so unexpected because you know what you're struggling with. But sometimes the things that you're, well, I will say there are a long list of things that people usually have that they know they want help with. There are some things that they would like help with, but they kind of don't even think to ask. Right. Because they don't know that it's either something they they can get help with, or they think it's some sort of inherent flaw within themselves, or maybe they just aren't there yet in that place in grief. And so like we can kind of head it off at the pass, which I love too. Yeah. Right. Well, it comes back to everything that we learn on mom goes on about our thoughts. Mm -hmm. Some of those are beliefs. And Mm -hmm. so we're just, those can't be changed. Mm -hmm. Until you realize that relatively new information for you in terms of your thoughts, cause your feelings and your feelings drive your actions. Yeah. Well, you know, I'd always known that that those two go together. I took Mm -hmm. psychology. I was going to become a psychologist. Mm. And so I was in college when I met my husband Mm. to become a psychologist. So I'd had some of those classes where those relate and how they work, but not until you actually see, for example, the model where Mm -hmm. you can actually go through that. And to me, it's almost like a math problem. Mm -hmm. I can go through all of those answers and get that result at the bottom that I was like, oh my goodness. Holy cow. Because you can't miss it if you do it right. Yeah. It's simple, but it's so powerful. I remember the first time I remember hearing, it was probably Brooke Castillo say, you know, everything in the world fits in one of these five lines. And there was something so comforting about knowing that I could help myself with Mm -hmm. one tool, right? I could help myself solve what felt like insurmountable obstacles and problems Absolutely. with one tool. Yeah. So I love teaching you, that tool. And it's interesting because I've never thought of myself as a logical, I'm not a logical thinker. I'm more of an abstract. Mm. And yet that was perfectly logical to me. Mm. So to wait, the way that lays out and you look at the model, it was just like, wow, that is exactly yeah. what I need to plug in these different areas and then come up with the result. Of mm-hmm. what what is going on and then what I want was amazing. Yeah. So what were some of the changes that you experienced? Like what did the tools and the coaching actually do for you? Well, the main problem that I well, not a problem, but the my main thought when I came in is Ken shouldn't have died. Yes. Ken should not mm-hmm. have died. Mm-hmm. Just absolutely. That was a fact. That was a very strong belief by seven months in of repeating that to myself over mm-hmm. and over again during mm-hmm. the day. So when we would go through the coaching and you had coached me, I, a few times, at least, if not more on that exact thing. And until you're ready to let your brain think something different, you can't think something different. Mm -hmm. And I remember we had coached and it was like the third or fourth time that we had coached Mm -hmm. in the group. And I'd been talking about this and for a while I couldn't even get through coaching without crying. I mean, I cried a lot. Mm -hmm. And one day you said, and it was, I've been coached on this for a few times, you know, more than I thought I needed. And you said, well, and it was always Ken shouldn't have died. And you said, well, what if Ken was supposed to have died? And that literally was a light bulb moment for me. Mm -hmm. I finally My brain could finally wrap itself around that. And when you said it that time, that was the start of changing everything. Mm. And I don't know if you realize how powerful that was 
for me. I know it really was life changing at that time. And that is the tool that I use continually is to, I look at my brain and I keep going over things and how can I do this? And yeah. 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 No, I, I, I don't think I probably realized it. No, I, I don't think you did. Cause I think you do that probably on a daily basis in your mm-hmm. coaching. Yeah. And I don't think that you realize the impact that it's making on people. That one for me was just an absolute eye-opening experience. But some of the other times that we coached, it was like, well, yeah, that makes perfect sense. But mm-hmm. that one, maybe, and maybe that was the one to break the barrier of learning to think differently. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I remember that having that experience myself, and I remember hearing that same idea kind of <laughs> dropped at my doorstep for consideration. And there was just a long amount of time where it felt offensive mm-hmm. to even contemplate it. And then I remember somehow I made a switch where I didn't actually believe that he should have died, but I remember a moment of believing, oh, it's just, it's my choice that I get to think what I want to think. I don't have to believe every thought that shows up in my mind about him and his death and what happened. I actually get to be the one who chooses what I think. And that was the difference for me. It wasn't about there is a right way to think or a wrong way to think. But I went from just being at the effect of my own thinking to realizing that I was the one who could choose. Yes. And that felt really freeing. Oh, it was just amazing. It it truly was life-changing. It was life-changing. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, and you really showed up for yourself. Like you were active on calls. You know, I I always tell people there's many ways to do the program and you can get a whole lot of crazy transformation and I and I never even get to see you on a call but you weren't that person you you were regularly asking for coaching and there yes. with your notebook and taking notes and like paying attention and so I was so. hungry I yeah. was hungry I did not like the state I was in and I didn't know how to get out of that mm-hmm. and so when I started on that program I was hungry to do whatever I could do to help myself mm-hmm. and I've always been like a, a self starter and a someone who seeks out knowledge to learn new things, but this was, mm-hmm. I, I ate this up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In fact, I ate this up so much that after I got done with your class, I went on to the life coach school I love and it. I, I just could not get enough. And, and certified it, as a coach. Like you didn't yeah, just like passively join their programs. You like went no. all in. Yeah. Yeah. I certified as a coach and I, and I didn't do it to coach. I mm-hmm. did, uh, although I have coached quite a few people and, but I did it for me. I did mm-hmm. it because I wanted that knowledge in yeah. my repertoire when yeah. I can when I can go get it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I the same thing for me, right? I same thing. W- when I had such a transformative experience for myself, yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, like I, I need more of this. And then and I could use it to help people. But oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, so yes. good. I wrote down in my notes from our original conversation. Well, actually, that's not true. This was actually straight from the application you filled out. So top three emotions you said you were feeling at the time were sadness, overwhelm, and anger. And I probably would be anger number one. Yeah. I th- We did have a lot of conversations about anger. You want to oh, talk man. about that? Yeah. It was my go-to. I just, anything, I would be fine to 10 on the anger scale, mm-hmm. just like that, mm-hmm. just in a flash and get me in the car, forget mm-hmm. it. I, it was awful. I, it really like road awful. rage. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I've never done, you know, I'm not a road rage kind of person. I, I was road rage at that point. I felt like life was unfair. Mm-hmm. I felt like, you know, I had been punished. I mean, you name it, I felt it. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. anger just came out. And you gave me some helps during coaching on how to deal with anger a little bit. And some of it was like for my own self, I would just plan to leave before I needed to be at a place. Mm. So if I was in traffic, Mm -hmm. I would be fine. I would Mm -hmm. not. And I would just think about that. You're going to be fine. You're going to be Mm -hmm. fine. You left in a timely manner. So that helped. And over time, 
that dissipated to a point, you know, I mean, you still, but the, the real, I think I might have even, I went back to a lot of my learning and my stuff I had gotten from you, the information, because a year after Ken died, I had a big family home evening at our house. Mm -hmm. And my brother, who is my best friend, was there with his family and he's very loud. We have a lot of fun and he's just goofy and loud. And he was talking over someone with a bunch of us in the room. So he was being louder than his normal loud. Mm -hmm. And I lost it. And then as soon as I had lost it, I thought, oh my gosh, what is wrong with you? And I went back and started doing a lot of models and a lot of downloads and a lot of, because I had to get that to where I was not hurting other people. Mm -hmm. And I apologized to him over and over again, but it was just, that was another turning point for me to get the help I needed by going back into what I had learned. Yeah. 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 And I think what can make it so problematic is when we're experiencing a lot of intense emotion and sometimes that's anger. And then we judge ourselves for it, right? We can make that anger mean that now we're an angry person or that there's something wrong with us or, and especially if you're part of a faith tradition that teaches yes, not to be angry, right? And like judging ourselves never really helps with that, but getting curious about it and really trying to compassionately understand why do I feel this anger? What is going on in my mind? What right. if it doesn't mean anything about me as a human? What if it is just a part of the grief that I'm experiencing right now? Right. And then we can kind of detach ourselves a little bit from it and not make it mean anything that it doesn't exactly. have to mean. Yeah. Yeah. I did have to do a lot of models on anger. There were so many things that went along with my anger mm-hmm. that I did a lot of models on anger to understand that I I am okay mm-hmm. through those models. And, and I could change those models to be what I wanted. Mm-hmm. You know, I could surround. I saw you had like a, a new sheet out that has the bubble with the little arms going off and then the little bubbles. It might be in your new coaching. I oh, the feelings myself. map. It's a feelings map. Is that what is that it what is? You're thinking of? Put- with the circumstance in the middle and then... The thought feeling, thought feeling on the oh, outside. That was it. Well, what I did, did is I put the anger in the middle and then wrote to, to what was all the thoughts that went around with my anger. Perfect. Then, That's a great use of that tool. Then yeah. I went ahead and did the models to match what those were. Because oh, I had I so it. many thoughts around my anger. Yes. So many thoughts. Thoughts about yeah. your anger or thoughts causing your anger or both? Both. Yeah. And so that really helped me to kind of see it out there in that way. Cause, and then I could go through each one and try to work through those models. Mm-hmm. There was so much involved in my anger. There was you just know, so much. That just makes me so happy because so sometimes I think people panic when they get into the program. They're like, it's six months long. What's going to happen after six months? Like, I'm, you know, if I don't get through all the materials in six months, it's a problem. And I love that. How many, it's been a couple of years since you've been in the program and yet you got back in there with an updated version of a workbook that wasn't even in the program when you were there and used it to help yourself. Yes. With, with, and I wasn't even there. You were not even surrounded by the program anymore. You just did it for yourself. I'm constantly on Slack and looking at the information. And I'm so grateful that in your group as a former person that I still have access to that Slack. Mm -hmm. And the information Good. in there, because I still go back in there and I read what yeah. people post and I will, and I took that book off and I have another use for that book that we talked about. Yes. And that has been so helpful. I just went back in and started diving back in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's talk about that. So one of the things we talked about before we pushed <laughs> record, and I really wanted to make sure we talked about it is it's important to me that the program and the coaching that I offer is not just a band-aid. It's not a an experience where we just solve the problems that you're experiencing. It's really important to me that we don't create a dependency on the coach and that by the time six months is over, you have what you need to solve whatever happens next, right? To support yourself through the challenges that will come after the program because they do. 
Right. And we don't need, well, now I can't help myself because I'm no longer in the program and I don't have a coach, right? We need, no, I have the tools and I know how my mind works and I know how to support myself, you know, with intense emotion and I'm ready. So can you talk about like, cause you're just the, the stellar example of continuing to have challenges in life and using the tools that you learned. Well, I was out of your program in January and then the following December, is that right? Last December, yeah. my son died. Yeah. So, um, I mean, anytime a child dies, there's no way to describe that. The pain is completely different. The heartache completely different than my husband. And my son lived close to me and would come over every day. After mm-hmm. my husband died, he was always my go-to, was always there, just showed up out of the blue and would just sit with me. And so when he died, it was like a, a double blow. And I immediately went to work to help my daughter-in-law and her three kids. Sure. But in that process, I thought, okay, I have got to get back into my coaching information. And I even contacted Becky to get onto some of the videos that we had done, Mm -hmm. the coaching calls, Yeah, because I needed to get that information back in my head so that when my daughter was my daughter-in-law was struggling, I could help her Mm -hmm. in areas. Because at the time when you're so emotionally involved, it's hard to be, unless it's hard to be who you want to be, unless you know the information well. Yeah. So I went back into all that information that you had given us, the manuals and all that, my books, my notebooks, and reworked myself through that process. Yeah. And the change with my son and my husband is I knew right away that I could pay attention to what my thoughts were doing Mm -hmm. and what emotions I was having. And I stepped back for a while, a few months, because I really wanted to focus on myself Mm -hmm. and my daughter-in-law and my grandkids. But I tell you what, that information was vital at that time, because it was like, that was where I could go to get back Mm -hmm. to where I can love my life again. Yeah. And that has been a process. I don't know that I'm actually there yet, but he's not, you know, he's only been gone a year, a year, Mm -hmm. but I know I will. Yeah. And that's the great thing is I know I have the tools Mm -hmm. that will keep me on that path moving Mm -hmm. forward. Yeah. I hate that it happened, but I'm so glad that you had the tools to fall back on. Well, we all, that's just it is when we got through with the mom goes on and life continues, Mm -hmm. you still have trials. Yeah. And that, I think when my son died, that really was a shocker for me because I thought that those trials were behind me. Mm Mm-hmm. I, I could never have dreamed mm-hmm. my son would die suddenly from a heart attack. Mm-hmm. And so just to know that, oh my gosh, really terrible things can happen again. Mm-hmm. That information was, was everything. Yeah. Yeah. And nobody ever really wants to do the feelings work. <laughs> they always kind of groan <laughs> when I, when I get them started on it. But I really am convinced that when we get good at allowing difficult emotions to pass through us, it makes the trials that are potentially in the future so much easier to bear. Just even, you know, if you've had such an intense experience of negative emotion and it was awful, then it makes sense that we would be anxious about more of that in the future. But we can't control the future. But what we can do is develop the muscle and the skill of being able to allow the emotion to pass through with less suffering, right? Exactly. Yeah. And and then it, it still doesn't make you look forward to things that could happen in the future, but it gives you the confidence that you could handle them. Yeah. You know, you have the tools yes. you need in your toolkit. Yeah. Another help that you gave me is one time I was feeling really, I don't know, I was judging myself for feeling sad. Mm-hmm. And that I should be able to keep going and I should be able to do better or or mm-hmm. whatever. You know, you just, what if yourself? Mm-hmm. And you said, it's okay to feel sad. Yeah. You lost your husband. 
And that was another one of those like, oh, aha moments. Mm. Because, and so then I would just sit for an hour and be sad. Mm -hmm. And then I would get up and get going. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing that I could allow myself to do that and feel better afterwards Mm -hmm. and feel more uh, able to do what I wanted to do. And I've helped with my daughter-in-law because when my son died, she then was mom and dad. And then she ran, she had a business. My son had a business. So she's now running the business. Mm -hmm. Just a lot of things on her plate. Yeah. And she said, I just can't do it all. I just am so sad. And I, and so I just told her, I said, allow yourself to be sad. Give yourself that hour or two in the morning to just sit on the couch and cry if you want. Mm -hmm. And then you'll feel better and able to go into the office and do the work you need to do. Mm -hmm. But I said, if you allow yourself that time to feel that, yeah, you feel better afterwards. Mm-hmm. Where do you think you picked up the message that it <clears throat> it wasn't okay to be sad or sadness was something to be avoided or solved? I think I just figured I should be over it sooner, over it. Mm-hmm. or you know, it's okay to be sad for a period of time, mm-hmm. but when that period of time passes, you need to get on your feet and get going. Mm-hmm. And that's not how it works. Yeah, and any any sadness after that point is now a weakness. That's <laughs> it's now a personality I- flaw. That's yeah. what I gave myself yeah. was that, you know, well, now you're, you're not capable because yeah. you are still sad, you know, yeah. you can be human going. for a certain amount of time, but after the, the after, yeah. you know, yeah. X number of months pass, you're no longer allowed to be human. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah. uh, so hard on ourselves. Yeah. yeah. The other thing I learned during that time was that I could allow myself. That's what I think that that was one of the things is I am given permission. Yeah, you can do mm-hmm. that. You and I think I didn't give myself permission for a lot of mm-hmm. those emotions. Yes. Makes it I, really hard. <laughs> it so does, but but it all makes sense. I mean, when you go back and you look at for most people what they were taught around emotion growing up or their particular culture or, you know, different things for different people, but a lot of us did receive the message that sadness is a problem. You know, emotions are things to fix or flaws or we should hide them or we should be past them or pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you know. Yeah. That kind of language. Yeah. Was it, I've been really fascinated lately by how some people that come to me are, it's super easy for them to, or at least it appears to me, super easy for them to invest in themselves and join a program like mine. And then others who really struggle to either see themselves as worth it Mm -hmm. or like they really struggle with being able to invest in something for them. Did you go through any of that? Was it an easy decision for you or did you struggle at all? I think at the time, yes and no. But I struggled with, my husband left me very well financially, Mm -hmm. but I struggled with the financial part because I just have never been one to spend money on myself. Mm -hmm. If I had nice things, my husband usually bought them for me, Mm -hmm. you know? And so I just never was one who... And that's probably a worthy thing. I never felt worthy Mm -hmm. of putting money out on myself. And that was the best investment I did. Yeah. But by the time I talked to you and you accepted me into the program, I was desperate enough for information or for something that would help Mm -hmm. me. I would have put out pretty much anything. Yeah. So it was like a rock bottom kind of experience for you, as opposed to a lot of women I'm reaching are kind of in that grief plateau place where, you know, it's not terrible. Mm -hmm. It's tolerable. They just don't love it. But for you, it was, it wasn't even tolerable. No, it wasn't even tolerable. No, I had really gotten myself in a hole and I did not see a way out. Mm -hmm. And so when I listened to your podcast and actually felt like this could be my way out. Yes. I was like clawing. I had a claw over to you to get into your program. You know, mm-hmm. if you would have said, told me, I don't think we're a good fit. I probably would have hounded you <laughs> until you finally said, yes. <laughs> Let me in. Exactly. Knocking at the yes. door. I'm coming. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad your friend referred you to me that you, you found the podcast, that it met you at the time where you needed it the most. And so proud of you for what you created with the program, right? I, I was talking to one of our kind of newer members yesterday on a coaching call and 
I just love her so much. Of course, I love everyone, but she's just the doll. And she was just like, you know, this is changing my life so much. And thank you. And and trying to give me all the credit. And it's like, I really appreciate hearing positive things that people say, but a lot of people have gone through the program and not everybody has the same experience, right? right? So it, it's not me. I'm providing the same tools to everyone, right? Mm-hmm. It is what you do with the experience that creates your results. And because you showed up for yourself and because you applied the tools and you asked for support and help, right? And you were open right. to it. That's what makes all the difference. It, it oh, is it makes all the difference. truly how you approach it. So, you know, yeah. good on you. Well, and my plan is I put some feelings out. My plan is now that I am going to hopefully I want to work with underprivileged women, maybe women in a homeless shelter, or I really want to help women. My former life, there's no way I could have ever afforded this. There just Mm -hmm. was no, I I pretty much was destitute. Yes. And I would mean like life pre Ken. Yes. Yeah. And I want to work with those women who are in that spot that I was Mm -hmm. in before, because I Mm -hmm. still would have been hungry for it. Mm -hmm. I just could never have. I mean, I was, I was barely surviving at that time. Yeah. And so my goal is to work with other women in that situation and help build them up Mm -hmm. and help them step maybe out of that area in their life and step into something they want more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have, is that something you're going to start soon? Do you have? I've contacted some women's resources and I'll see what I hear back. This is not a Mm -hmm. good time of year because they're so busy. Yeah. So, but yeah, I plan to pursue that and work with the women that are like I was before I ever met Ken. So here's what we could say. So anybody who's in Washington, South of Seattle. (laughs) Yeah. If you know of any opportunities, yeah. you know, yeah. for low, like women who are struggling and would want yes, some sort of coaching support. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting because when I was talking about doing that and I was trying to come up with a booklet, what I could use, and then you put your newest booklet <laughs> on Slack. Mm-hmm. And I yeah, we just redid just all like, of our workbooks <gasps> recently. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So I contacted you immediately to see if that would be available for me to print off and use for my mm-hmm. these women when I ever get that chance to finally do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm when you in. said that I'm all for it, I was just like, oh my gosh, that took such a weight off my shoulders to try to come yeah, up let's with Let's go my change own. the world. Yeah. 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 Did you check out the skills, the mindset and skills scorecard yet? Did you see that in the workbook? No. Okay. It's brand new. You'll have to look at it. Oh um, yeah. So, and I'm really excited about it. I say brand new. It's I think this was month six of having it, but we created a, I wanted something that was a little bit better than the life wheel assessment that we used to use, right? Right. To just kind of help people assess where they're starting and then also track their progress and then also expand what's possible. And so we created this mindset and skills scorecard. And so it has, it goes through 24 areas, which are like the key mindset shifts and and skills that we're working on in Mom Goes On. You do a rating of yourself, right? It's not a, there's no grades, there's no prizes, there's no, it's not like a, we're not judging you, but where are you starting? And then in the middle of the program, do it again. Where are you now? And then at the end of the program, how far have you come? And I love it because it's so fun just starting to see the numbers come in at the six month point for people and the increases in scores are really exciting for me. Plus, it's also just going to be a way, I think, for me to be able to look and see, you know, where are people experiencing the greatest transformation and what are the areas that maybe are are lagging and how can we improve those, right? It's kind of a a window into what people are getting out of the program for me. But yeah, it'd be it'd be interesting oh, for yeah. you to go take it now, kind of assess where you are now and then see if you can maybe go back just for your own benefit, you know, to celebrate yourself of where you started. Oh yeah. Like where oh. would you have rated yourself when you started? And yeah, celebrate that. The expanse would be huge yeah. because yeah. I have grown so much in the program that you have. Yeah. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Is there anything else that you wanted to share with people? Do we miss anything? Just that invest in yourself. I mean, what a wonderful thing that you're offering. 
Mm -hmm. And I, when I just did it, you know, even though I had doubts and I wondered and I just did it and it was truly life-changing. It just really, it made all the difference in the world of how I could handle and manage my husband's death and now Mm -hmm. my son's death. Yeah, And so I can't say enough about people getting that just for themselves, just to help who they are. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's an amazing program. I love that. I've been thinking about it a little more holistically as, especially as some of the women that I have worked with, you know, I've continued to have relationships with them now, you know, years after they've completed the program. And then I watch what they go through in life. And I also have just watched, I think what probably touches me the most is what their children have gone through and how they have been better equipped to help their children. And some, for some of them, it's like you where their children are grown and you know, you're helping your daughter-in-law in her grief, you're helping yourself in your own grief. And it's not always death-related grief. Sometimes it's just watching them support their kids go mm-hmm. through just the challenges of being a human on this planet, right? And the ripple effect that that is having in the world. And then watching people like you go and become coaches and and other clients, you know, that have done the program and then have gone on to become coaches and then watch the people they're helping. And it's just such a rewarding thing to, to be part of something that ripples into the world. Well, my whole family, I've coached almost everybody in my family at some point or another. And it's just, yeah, you just can spread out and help people. And family and close, you know, those that have contacted me to coach them. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing. It's someday this is going to be normal. Someday everybody's going to have a coach. We're going to look back and we're like, remember when we didn't even have, nobody knew what life coaching was and we didn't have a coach. And now everybody has one. We're headed there. Yeah. I think we should be headed there. I think that that would be a wonderful asset for everybody. And then I think grief will be so much easier. Mm-hmm. Right. Because it won't be us waiting until our spouse dies to learn how to feel our feelings and, yeah. you know, process intense emotion and f- change our thinking. You know, it won't be a problem solution. It'll, it'll be preventative. Well, and it won't yeah. be in a situation where I was at, where you're absolutely destitute. Yes. You're, well, not, not destitute, but you're desperate yes. for something. Yes. It will be something that you already have on hand. Wait, yeah. I already know how to do that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I I was just to the point where I saw no other way. Mm -hmm. And this was just like a bright light in a very dark, dark Mm -hmm. hole. And it was, yeah, it was just amazing, life-changing. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and for being so open and sharing your story. It really does help other people to hear that they aren't alone and to hear similarities in their story. And, you know, imagine when you were in that place, right? And here you are now. You know, I've had friends who have lost either spouses or children or something, and I am right there with them. Yeah. I just yeah. immediately am at their door. I'm immediately, yeah. you know, talking to them about things. And I just want to help whoever I can. Yeah. With this information. Love it. So if people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way? Should they go through me? Probably. I okay. don't, you know what? I, I just really haven't. Yeah, because I haven't really reached out or started any process okay. of any program. But all right. Yeah. So we'll just say if anybody wants to, if you have an opportunity that you want to forward on to Annette or you want to talk to Annette, you want to get in touch with her, come through me. You can email me, Krista at coachingwithkrista.com, and then I'll connect you. Okay. okay. Thank you so much, Annette. You take Thank care of yourself. You. Okay. All right. All right we'll talk Thank soon. <laughs> bye okay. bye. Bye. If you like what you've been hearing on this podcast and want to create a future you can truly get excited about even after the loss of your spouse, I invite you to join my Mom Goes On coaching program. It's small group coaching just for widowed moms like you, where I'll help you figure out what's holding you back and give you the tools and support you need so you can move forward with confidence. Please don't settle for a new normal that's less than what you deserve. Go to coachingwithkrista.com and click work with me for details and next steps. I can't wait to meet you.